Hello and welcome to another installment of wrapping up World War I on our way to the foundation of the Nazi Party. So we've gone through the Treaty of Brest-Litovsk, we've talked about the military situation uh, leading up to the armistice on November 11th, and now we come to the revolution. Now there's going to be a lot of stuff left out here. There's a lot of stuff that is uh, necessary to understand, which we're, we might mention, but then we're going to pivot away from it. We're picking out key parts here. Um, probably the book that's absolutely, that's probably that's the best read, and it is the most recent thing um, on it, is um, Gervart's November 1918, which was published last year. Uh, it's a good readable account. It hits all the... Uh, all the all the bases and it lays out pretty clearly a, a nice uh, chronology and narrative so without any further ado let's let's get into some of these uh, issues because of course the how World War one ends is crucially important for how the Nazi party uh, is going to seed and grow this does not come out of nowhere so we've looked at a couple issues. We have the Eastern European issue. We have the way defeat happens versus the way it's perceived on the Western Front. And now we come to revolution. So um, one of the first things we see here is kind of dumping us right into the into the heart of the action. Um, the soldiers uh, and sailors and workers councils and the way they spread throughout Germany as the revolution spreads. You'll notice uh, up at the top of the map, November 5th and 6th, um, you have the naval mutiny, and then it's uh, it spreads throughout northern Germany, and then by November 9th, uh, which is the proclamation of the German Republic, you'll see Berlin, as well as a lot of the Ruhr, the industrial heartland down the Rhine River, and at various places um, in Bavaria, uh, of course, Munich ha had um, basically established the council's uh, a council government the day before, and then by the tenth of tenth of November, it's spreading into Silesia and even into East Prussia. Now, there is a long backstory and a background to this. You don't suddenly have revolution uh, burst into uh, into the the, the firmament uh, and alter the constellation of political power. Now. We, you might recall when we talked about the military events of 1918 that uh, Germany asked for an armistice in October. Now, at this point, remember, the Treaty of Brussels-Tosk has basically become uh, a dead letter. The military has overthrown the, Ukrainian, the, the democratic Ukrainian government, democratically elected government. Um, and... To the Wilson administration, this looks all looks pretty bad. Um, it looks like, again, Germany cannot be trusted. And so Wilson's uh, tone becomes much, much harsher. And the German attempt to circumvent France and Britain and deal directly with Wilson as someone who's going to uh, give them a, a peace without victors uh, seems to have failed. Uh, Wilson is the Wilson's line is become very strident and insistent that you're going to have to change your form of government. You need to show that you're curbing the influence of the military, Hindenburg and Ludendorff's um, effectively military government. Uh, sometimes it, it can be somewhat overstated um, because, you know, there is the Reichstag does still exist there. There is a, a civilian government. Um, but when you look at some of the documents I've had you look at, which include some, uh, say, Batman Holweg's uh, report of uh, to, to Hindenburg of tensions between the civilians and the military, you know, it's quite clear who's in the driver's seat. So, was this October 20th, 28th? Uh, I'm gonna, whatever turn of I say will be the other one. Um, Hindenburg and Ludendorff are summoned to report to the Kaiser. Uh, uh, the Kaiser's headquarters here is at the city of Spa in Belgium. And Ludendorff is dismissed. Wilhelm Gröner is uh, called in to take his place. So even though if you're familiar with this period at all, you're familiar with Hindenburg and Ludendorff, you also have Gröner 
uh, G-R-O-E-N-E-R, -E -E as a key player at this point in time. Uh, reaction uh, among those who actually were in the know about this was like, well, yeah, it, Ludendorff shouldn't have launched those offensives. He does bear the blame, but how, uh, how do we get along without him? Uh, because he is he's regarded as as pretty brilliant. So uh, those hopefully though that measure will will appease Wilson. The other thing, of course, they're trying to do as November as October goes on is to introduce actual reforms to turn the Hohenzollern monarchy into a constitutional monarchy. Now remember, you have Prince Max of Baden, who's a a, a liberal. Um, and whose government enjoys sort of widespread support from different parties of the Reichstag. Um, so there's feeling among the reformers that they can work with him. Um, so, so Wilson's demand that the Germans uh, liberalize their government would seem to fall on fertile ground. Um, now, it's in this context then that... Um, there begin to be uh, revolutionary rumblings um, when these uh, when these reforms don't really seem to work. So um, I want to draw attention here to a couple a couple pass a couple passages in Gervarts uh, particularly. Um, so the issue is not that uh, is not that oh people didn't want. Uh, liberalization or constitutional monarchy. The problem is rather that these reforms were too little too late. Remember what I said in the last lecture. The the feeling among uh, army, the German army censors, the people who read and censor soldiers' mail, make sure they're not um, you know, uh, giving away operational details, uh, and also they're checking the mood, checking checking for signs of, of, of disaffection in the ranks. You know, the, the assessment of the army censors was that the troops are willing to give their give it their all for this this last this spring offensive, but there has to be peace on the other side of it, um, and so um, Gervard makes the point. So then, page seventy six, with the military collapse in the autumn of nineteen eighteen, any remaining support for the imperial state evaporated. The deterioration of military discipline, the crumbling of the authoritarian governing system, the mounting military and political pressure for pressures from the Allies, alongside extreme war weariness at home and the example of Russia, combined to create an overwhelming crisis of legitimacy. Because remember, the other thing that, that most people, and as will turn out, the mainline Social Democrats don't want is they don't want to be Russia. They're looking east, they're looking at the Bolshevik Revolution, they're just like, oh, heck no. Um, and that's going to wind up being crucial uh, in the sort of in the outcome of the German Revolution in November. Um, and uh, as these these forces of revolution begin to begin to gather, a couple things a couple things are happening. One, the Kaiser is starting to get a little frustrated. Um, he's he's as far as he's concerned, he's doing his best to try to work uh, with an appease Wilson. But now this is starting to look more and more like open rebellion. And he's he begins to wonder uh, and certainly his, his and his, his advisors are are wondering whether the army could be counted on if they left the front and march back to Berlin uh, and actually uh, put down uh, put down dissident uh, dissident forces. Um, and so. Uh, this is going to lead uh, to uh, to an interesting confrontation, interesting uh, survey, and we happen to have some some details of this, like uh, as the revolution is unfolding, the spark of the revolution. Uh, and for this, um, this is a slightly different map, um, sort of differentiating um, between workers and soldiers councils through November 9th, and then the dots afterward. Uh, and then the Sailors' Mutiny, uh, late October, early November. So it's a similar data, but presented in a somewhat uh, different way. The spark of all this is the Sailors' Uprising. Um, the German Naval High Command has decided that to salvage their honor, the honor of the German fleet, they should sally out and engage the British fleet in one last grand uh, engagement. 
the German fleet was going to lose that. Um, the Battle of Jutland in 1916 had shown that, however uh, tactically proficient the Germans were, uh, and they inflicted far more damage on the British than the British inflicted on the Germans. Uh, the German Navy did not have the, just the sheer weight uh, of numbers and guns to, uh, to, to defeat the British fleet. You know, they, they handle the British battlecruisers really roughly, but when the line of British capital ships, the, the main dreadnoughts, are coming up, um, you know, it's, it's, and it looks like, you know, they, they've crossed the T of the, of the German formation. Um, they can't, the, the Germans can't, the fleet can't deal with that. So a rematch is probably not going to yield any other result except to kill thousands of men. And at this, the sailors have, have had enough. You have uh, an uprising. Um, we looked at the, the 14, their own 14 points, um, uh, which involve uh, sort of relaxation of, uh, of, of authority and, uh, and discipline uh, when you're off duty. Um, and also locking down control of the affairs of these battalions uh, in naval in naval brigades uh, from from interference by the pre-existing chain of command. So that this is uh, this is in from Wilhelmshaven, November sixth, um, November eighth. Bavaria breaks away from Germany completely and declares a republic. This is the so this is the the council government. We'll hear a bit about this when we get to uh, Hitler and the origins of the Nazi Party because um, it's on November 21st that Hitler will arrive back in Munich um, less than two weeks after the proclamation of the Bavarian Republic. So, um, as we've seen, by November, uh, November 8th, it's, it's looking increasingly likely that these... Uh, Workers and soldiers' councils could very well even take over Berlin. There's feverish excitement uh, among the among the, the the sort of the new communist uh, party, uh, which is very closely anticipating uh, the outbreak of of the, the the proletariat revolution. And it's at this point that the Kaiser begins to think, "Am I going to have to march the army back to Berlin?" So this is uh, November November eighth. Uh, a call goes out to about was it, 50, 55 to 63 sort of mid-level commanders. They sort of are canvassing the commander commanders uh, throughout the army. And about, what was it, about 38, probably about 40 of them assemble in Spa on the morning of November 9th. And they are asked, uh, they are asked two questions. They are asked, Will your, would your troops follow the Kaiser? to um, put down rebellion uh, you know in Berlin or elsewhere and two what are your, what are your, what's your troops attitude toward Bolshevism um, and the results were very disappointing and very shocking for those in the Imperial party who hoped the army would rally behind the monarch um, when you combine the Heck no, we, we, my troops wouldn't do it too. They probably wouldn't do it. You're talking upwards of about 60% of the commanders present uh, are not sh sure that their troops would actually obey them. Only about eight, uh, I think it was about eight of those present said, yes, we will. Uh, I've no doubt my troops will follow his majesty uh, to the gates of hell, you know, for, for the fatherland. Um, now, this is not a huge sample. The you know, German army is several million strong, and you know this is kind of a it's a very it's not what we would call statistically reliable, but it's suggestive, and it sort of goes along with all the other reports of increased desertion, uh, sort of def def depressed, defeatist talk in the ranks, and sort of a general lack of fighting spirit and exhaustion uh, in the German army, uh, and so this is conveyed to the Kaiser, and. Um, this is the morning of November 9th. Now, while this is going on, almost like almost literally at the same time that this is going on, you have these leaflets being distributed in Berlin on November 9th. Now, this is from the, the communists. This is from the communists. Um, this is Karl Liebknecht's work. Uh, and in fact, Liebknecht has a, a second uh, a second leaflet. 
um, uh, that he that his name is not on it, but we know that he, he was the one who wrote it, um, decrying the socialists who have appeased the government and they're trying to buy off the workers. So they are really trying hard here to have the proletarian revolution. Um, it's a historic task. Um, this is the start of a military dictatorship. So they promised reform, but they're really starting a military dictatorship. We do not demand the abdication of one person. We demand a republic, the socialist republic with all its consequences. Let us fight for peace, freedom, and bread. Come out of the factories. Come out of the barracks. Uh, take each other by the hand. Pardon the typo there. Long live the socialist republic. Stirring stuff. That morning... The two leaders of uh, the main, the main line Social Democratic Party, not the the anti-war independents who split in 1917, they're they're gradually coming back, coming back online, if you will. But the main line Social Democrats, um, Philip Scheidemann and Friedrich Ebert, go and pay a visit to Max of Baden, uh, who is the Chancellor at the time, and they are negotiating. Uh, they're negotiating what exactly to do. They've already they proclaimed the Kaiser's abdication. So the Kaiser learns that he's abdicated from the news. Um, and Scheidemann gives this speech proclaiming the German Republic. This is from the Reich Chancery window. And it's kind of cool because this is one of those series of pictures. And there's actually a lot more. This was very well documented in terms of photography. Um, where we actually know the, the the story and the timing, the actions that take place in which these represent sort of stop-motion moments. So Scheidemann proclaims the Republic. Um, you know, the, the Kaiser the Kaiser is is gone. Um, he gets down from that window uh, balcony and he's walking through the halls. Ebert actually accosts him. Ebert's not actually not very happy um, because. Uh, Scheidemann had no actual authority to proclaim that on whose uh, uh, who did he speak for when he proclaimed the German Republic well, you know, they hadn't really affected a transfer of government um, if anyone if anyone can speak for the German people it would be the Reichstag but they haven't really been consulted on this Scheidemann's reasoning however is that look if we don't if we don't do this now right remember the the communist leaflets are being uh, distributed they're mobilizing. Um, Liebknecht and Rosa Luxemburg have made no secret that they're pushing for this. If we don't do this now, they'll proclaim a rep a, a Soviet-style uh, republic first, and now we're on the back foot, and they have the high ground. So we have to do this. And this kind of encapsulates the uh, the contradiction and the, the, the rock and the hard place that, that the liberals are in in Germany in 1918. Um to to force if you want to forestall the bolshevik a bolshevik style revolution you have to act extra constitutionally if you act constitutionally you cede the ground to the far left radicals and you probably have a much bigger issue on your hands in any case they go to see uh, max they go to see max baden they demand the the that he turn the government over to them the mainline social democrats are quite willing and ready to share power and have a mixed cabinet. Um, as long as most of the ministerial positions are filled by the Social Democrats, they don't want this to get out of control. Um, Max, is, Max is, is concerned about the army, and Scheidemann says, don't worry, we, we can handle that. The army, we're already, we're not worried about the army. The army's going to be on our side. So it looks like uh, the German Republic is now a fact. And so within in these few days, after November 9th, the Kaiser goes to the Netherlands, and the Netherlands lets him in, which wasn't exactly a sure thing, but um, you know, the Netherlands excuse me, is a monarchy as well, and they're kind of thinking, again, we don't want a scene like what happened in Russia. That's, that doesn't, that, that's, that's not good optics. I mean, the Bolsheviks might think there's good optics. No one else does. So the Kaiser, uh, the Kaiser is gone. This all happens... In the matter of a week, you have a monarchy, you have a you have a, a an abs a sort of quasi absolutist monarchy, which is now trying to be constitutional, and within a week, it's gone. Everything is gone. Um, and then the armistice happens, 
at right about the same time. So they're still fighting on the Western Front, uh, particularly in the American sector, where um, Pershing, the, the American commander, uh, doesn't think the armistice is a good idea. Um, his opinion is they need they should be carrying the war actually into Germany because if you don't actually show them that they've been militarily defeated, they're going to claim they weren't. Pershing's actually exactly right about this, um, but he has his he orders his generals to keep assault, attacking almost right up to the armistice point. Like over three thousand American troops are killed. He's hauled before a, a Senate a Senate committee after the war to explain why did you sacrifice American lives? Because you you may have been right about that, and no one thinks he is at the time, but that accomplished nothing. So the armistice is happening in the middle of this as well. Now, one of Ebert's main jobs, and this is actually something that he and the, the new um, Republican government, it's not technically the Weimar government yet, um, although we, we, by convenience we say, oh, it's now Weimar Republic. Um, one of the main things he has to do, and he doesn't get uh, as much credit for it as he should, is actually demobilize the German military. Um, and they do this. They do this pretty well. In fact, um, probably the best study on this um, uh, that's been that that is is worth um, looking at is um, uh, Richard Bessel's book. It's an early Richard Bessel, um, Germany after the First World War. It's one of very early work of his. Um, of course, he's since gone on to do um, Nazism and War, which is uh, an absolute classic. It's actually one of my one of my favorites. One of the books I quote unquote cut my teeth on on this subject uh, in grad school. So Bessel's study of, of demobilization is actually, this is it's really top-notch. So a lot of what Ebert has to do is he spends a lot of his, his first weeks um, as, the, as the chancellor of this new government um, going to the border and giving speeches to welcoming, welcome home speeches to troops who are coming back uh, from, from the Western Front. Uh, so we actually have a fair amount of photography of, of this phenomenon. We have records of some of his speeches. You know, it's, you know, there's, you know, you fought, you fought with honor, you are, you are heroes, you gave it all for the fatherland, and so on and so forth. The reception to these speeches, well, you know, it's kind of a bit mixed, uh, as you may imagine. Um, here we have uh, German troops uh, crossing the Rhine at Cologne. You can just make out the cathedral. Uh, and for the Church of Great St. Martin uh, in the background there. Um, and um, January, this would be January 1919, so it's, it's ongoing. Um, but what you do see here is uh, you see a society which may be shaken but is still functioning, right? And, of course, to me as a historian, one of the things I, I find s most fascinating is trying to capture... Um, you know, in writing, but also in my own in my own head, what what is the what is your consciousness if you're at, at at the time that these things are happening? So you know, what does it mean for society to be shaken, for there to be disorder, uh, for there to be you know troubled times and revolution? I mean, those words they have no actual concrete meaning. What are the markers by which you know, depending on your social, political, religious? Uh, class station would would judge some uh, tr times to be troubled, um, because trolley cars are still running, police and soldiers and supermarkets are still there, shops are still open and clothes are being bought and people are you know having going out having a beer that kind of thing. So you know there is clear there is a lot of uh, of unrest. This new government um, and I keep meaning to. Uh, review the. I keep meaning to review the, uh, uh, the folks on this because I believe uh, some of them are, are center party, if I'm remembering correctly, um, and of course you have Ebert and Scheidemann. Um, some of them are independent social demo. There's it's a mix of independent social democrats and then the sort of the mainline social democrats. Um, First Council of People's Representatives. These are not unfamiliar figures to a lot of people in Germany or certainly in in uh, in Berlin, but um, things are moving very rapidly. Now, um, what still is in existence, however, are the soldiers and sailors and workers councils, and what Rosa Luxemburg and Karl Liebknecht are hoping is that this will this will transform into a general revolution a general proletariat revolution uh, that will sweep aside uh, this sort of the social democrat 
uh, government as well. Because you also have to remember um, the the you know going to back to November 9th, they've marked the Social Democrats who are trying to form this new constitutional government uh, as enemies as well. Um, what prompts the actual uprising, such as it was, this it's it's spontaneous, it's somewhat spontaneous, it's ill coordinated, it's not very well planned. Um, although Luxembourg and Liebknecht, who's at the the bottom center there, um, they have high hopes uh, of this, um, involves increasing dis increasing concern on the part of Ebert and Scheidemann. Um, that the military units in and around Berlin would not be able to handle uh, a, a radical uh, uprising. Um, there are there are naval there's sort of the naval brigades which are revolutionary uh, in their orientation. Um, it's it's not clear that they're, the, the military units there can actually handle them. Um, and it's also not clear they have the, the, the loyalty or cooperation of a fair number of senior members of the Berlin police. And it's the dismissal of uh, one of the main sort of far left, the left communist sympathizers in the Berlin police that sparks the uprising. Luxembourg and Liefknecht and their allies uh, think this is a signal that uh, Ebert's government is about to do a clean sweep of the security forces and and crack down hard with lots of arrests and executions and that's what launches uh the the sort of the christmas uprising which lasts for about almost three weeks um, the person who winds up putting it down is gustav noska who um ebert turns to uh to sort of take charge of things now noska is a social democrat and he was of the same wing as Ebert and Scheidemann. Um, he's Minister of Defense, 1919 uh, to 1920. He was actually sent to um, was it Kiel, I think it was Kiel, um, to deal with uh, the the sailors' mutiny at the request of Prince Max when Max was still Chancellor. Um, and he manages to to you know, talk them into sort of coming back to coming back to duty, accepting the authority of officers and sort of sort of pacifying that situation without, uh, you know, enormous amounts of, of enormous amounts of coercion or bloodshed. Ebert turns to him to take charge of things in Berlin. And now Noska is actually very much in favor of bringing in hard, uh, brutal military force. Uh, to put these to put this down, he turns to the Freikorps. Um, this name, the the free the free units, um, kind of is try is sort of deliberately evocative of the the war of liberation against Napoleon in 1813. Uh, they are technically supposed to function as some sort of organized armed militia. At this point, that's that's a little bit in the future. Um, these are mostly young men who have come back from the front, um, who are not very sympathetic toward um, workers, soldiers, and sailors' revolutionary activities, and have uh, no sympathy whatsoever for um, communists, uh, let alone Bolsheviks. Um, so Noska, um, even though he's a social democrat, partners with uh, these units and ha turns them loose against the, the Spartacists, um, as this, this movement, uh, Luxembourg and Liebknecht's movement, is called. Um, the Luxembourg and Liebknecht are, at this point, fleeing through the city from safe house to safe house, but on uh, January 15th, their safe house is raided. Um, they are arrested by Freikorps members. They are beaten to pulp, and then uh, they are both shot. Liebknecht's body is dumped uh, in a park. Rose Luxembourg's body is dumped in a canal. Um, and that's that's pretty much the end of that. There was next to no chance of their movement revolution succeeding. It provides an awful lot of fodder uh, for, the right, for the conservatives, for the right, and especially the emerging far right. Um, although Bavaria, which is a whole other situation, we'll talk about that when we get to, to Hitler. Um, well, actually, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Um, uh, this is this is a, a, a Varia is actually 
just as much or even more fodder for for uh, reactionary forces. This sows the seeds of distrust and hatred between the Communist Party and the Social Democrats. This is one key reason why they will never work together, um, even as it becomes increasingly clear that the National Socialists are becoming a major threat, um, because the Communists do not forget that uh, when, when push came to shove, um, Ebert and Scheidemann and Nosco would rather side with far-right paramilitaries and have them slaughtered than actually work toward um, you know supposedly socialist ideals. And one of the key things, and and uh, Grerworth draws attention to this. One of the key things that transpires in this very short period of time is Ebert's uh, transition. From someone who's definitely left of center to someone whose overwhelming concern is not to have a Bolshevik revolution in Germany, and any signs of it must be uh, must be uh, crushed without mercy. Um, and we actually have some photography from this period of street clashes uh, in Berlin. This is in, in the January uprising. Um, now, you know, in the meantime, after this, uh, as this is going on. You know, life goes on. There, um, uh, there are election campaigns. Um, everything seems to be on the table. Uh, women's suffrage is on the table. Um, you know, new social programs and and new new constitution, new ways of doing politics are on the table. Um, so all of this is going on at once as the army is being coming back and being demobilized, and tens of thousands of young men. Are, are sort of trying to fit back into into society. The Kaiser is now gone. You have new household names. Um, you have shifting alliances. Um, this is the German Revolution. And this is on November 21st, 1918. Um, this is the world that Hitler's going to come back into when he gets gets out of hospital and gets to Munich and reports for duty to the, uh, the mil one of the military units stationed in Munich, Bavaria. All right, this is pretty much where we're going to stop here, and we will pick up with some of the specifics of Versailles and the the chaotic political order uh, from 1919 to about 1924 next time.